Okay, we're rolling. All right, this is an interview at the Buffalo and Erie County Historical Society, Manningham Terrace, Buffalo, New York. It is the 22nd of August, 2006, approximately 2.30 p.m. Interviewers are Mike Russert and Wayne Clark. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? Charles Trainer, T-R-E-A-N-O-R, born in Buffalo, October 22nd, 1924. Okay. Um, what was your educational background prior to entering the service? I had high school graduate. Mm -hmm. okay. But I graduated from high school in 41, so I worked for a year and a half or so before I was 18. Okay, where did you work? At an insurance company down, downtown Buffalo. Okay. Do you remember where you were when you heard about Pearl Harbor? I have surprisingly a short memory of that. I remember that all of a sudden we were in a war, but I, the, the actual Sunday that the, the news came out, I don't have a specific memory of it. Okay, okay. Um, did you enlist or were you drafted? No, I enlisted, but anybody when he turned 18 was subject to draft, so mm -hmm. I enlisted. Okay. Yeah. Um, did you select the Army Air Corps then? Yes. Okay, well, why did you select? Well, there was a course in meteorology that uh, I could sign up for. I needed certain requirements, but a high school graduate with reasonable grades would get into it. Mm -hmm. And uh, it just sounded like the kind of thing I'd be interested in. So I signed up for the Air Corps Meteorology Program. Okay. Um, did you, had you ever flown up until that time? Did you, no. Did you have an interest in, interest in flying? No, not the flying. The, the meteorology was what attracted okay. me. Okay. Um, where did you, uh, where were you inducted? Well, I was inducted in Buffalo, but went to Fort Niagara, of course. Okay. And then, uh, you, where did you go for basic? Uh, Atlantic City. All right. Um, how long were you there, and, and what did you do there? You well, there? basic training, I, I don't know exactly how long it was now, a couple months maybe at the most. Mm -hmm. uh, and we learned to march and that sort of thing, climb over obstacles. Mm -hmm. Oh, is this the first time you were ever away from home for an extended period? Oh, yes. It was the first time I'd been far from Buffalo at all. Mm -hmm. How did you feel? It was, a, it was a big adventure to go to Fort, from Fort Niagara down to Atlantic City on the train. And for reasons absolutely unknown to me, they told me I was in charge of the group going down, which was maybe about 25 people, something like that. Mm -hmm. And so they gave me all the papers, and so I was responsible for it. The first thing that happened is when we got off the train, I didn't take the papers with me. They came running after me with the papers. So that was my first important job that I messed up in the air. But uh, it was a very memorable trip. We stopped for breakfast in uh, some place near Atlantic City. It was, uh, and I had the vouchers to pay for things. That was all completely new experience. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, did, you, did you end up in... Uh Meteorolo meteorolo <laughs> Meteorology. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, actually, I went through a course that was supposed to be pre meteorology, mm -hmm. which we had at the University of Minnesota. And uh, so I was at the University of Minnesota in the pre meteorology program for a year. Mm -hmm. And uh, at that point, they decided they had enough meteorologists. And so we could all go into different branches, be navigators or different things. I chose communication officer. And so um, I was transferred to communication school. And where was that? Well, they started with a officer training type thing down in North Carolina, Goldsboro, North Carolina. Please. And then we went for the technical training and went to Yale for, uh, I think, three months. And uh, learned about airplane communication systems and radio. So you were eventually going to be commissioned as an officer That's right. to, to run that program? Yes. After the course at Yale, we were commissioned as second lieutenant. So. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, from there, I was, uh, my first assignment was teaching at a school in Illinois, a church course school at Chinook Field. You know, and, uh, while I was teaching there, I got assigned to uh, a 
group that was being put together there at Chinook, which was a, called the 8th Emergency Rescue Squad. And uh, it, was a, it was put together as a squadron to do rescue work with helicopters. Uh, this was back before helicopters were such a common part of uh, the Army. Mm -hmm. and, uh, all went to the idea was to use them in China for rescue work. And uh, I, I, in telling you about the sequence of things, the one thing I skipped was we had some time in Texas. That uh, when we were in North Carolina, they decided to move us to Texas for some reason. And uh, so we moved to San Antonio for part of that three month training, uh, which was OCS training. Officer Candidate, Candidate, in school. Office, Candidate in School, right? And uh, so we finished that up in uh, San Antonio. But uh, then the assignment to go with the uh, Eighth Emergency Rescue Squadron uh, then went from where it got put all put together at Shunfield Field in Illinois, went to India, and then to China uh, over the hump. What what type of helicopters were you using? They were a Sikorsky, the, the rating of them was a Sikorsky Y5. Mm -hmm. The Y was uh, experimental, but, uh, not, not experimental, but uh, field study. X was experimental, and Y was uh, being studied in the field to see if they complied. And that's what we were doing, was testing it to see if it worked for rescue work. Mm -hmm. Was it, did you find it to be a Viable, well, uh, the big problem with the helicopters at that point, they required a tremendous amount of maintenance. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so they'd fly for an hour and they'd require at least an hour of maintenance after an hour's flight. Uh, the trouble with that particular application in the hump in, in India, which is where they were trying it out, was uh, that most of the accidents, aircraft accidents that happened in, in the mountains there were fatal. So their rescue didn't apply very well. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but the the helicopters, I think their biggest problem was the maintenance of them, as far as that testing is concerned. Now, what exactly was your job? Well, my job as communications officer was really just to see that the communications of our aircraft continued to work, of course, mm -hmm. and uh, set up a. Arrangement. We had several enlisted men who were very good technicians. And, uh, we had to set up a place to uh, operate from, of course. And, uh, I think the, uh, see, we had other airplanes too, you know, for instance, to spot the wrecks and where they were. And mm -hmm. We had a C 47. And, uh, actually, we had an old B 25 that we used to at some point. And, uh, now, how many were in your unit? Uh, I would have to guess on that. I would say 15, something like that. Hmm. It, so it was a very small. It was a very small. It was just a squadron, and it was operating in an unusual way, and it was independent operation. And, uh, what now, did, did you have much contact with the Chinese then, or is that who you worked with mainly? With well, the, the or Chinese they just were in China. It, it was. In China, so of course we had Chinese working with us, uh, but not as, I mean, strictly as uh, food personnel and so on, mm -hmm. the, uh, doing work around the camp and so on. They hired local Chinese, of course. What were your living conditions like there? Oh, they were, they, they were barracks type living and tent living, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, we started there when our tent was near the end of the runway, so there were planes coming in all night long. But after a couple of days, you get used to that, so it wasn't bad at all. And, uh, and then we moved into some barracks there that were reasonably comfortable. They were buildings that had been there. And it was up in the mountains, so it was very comfortable, nice weather. So I can't say anything negative about it. Mm -hmm. Now, the kind of food. Did you have much local food, or was it uh, military food? No, we, mostly we had military food. We didn't have too much local food. We, uh, we had the, what the Chinese called megwa eggs, which are, of course, artificial egg. 
poker. Not, not, we didn't eat the local eggs. Mm -hmm. and, uh, the Chinese thought that was very funny because of the eggs we ate. Now, did you ever have any contact at all with the Chinese Army forces? Well, not any official contact with them. We had some connection that I recall one fellow with a bad skin disease. I don't know what it was, but he, he had quite bad skin eruptions all over his face and back and so on. He came to us looking for help for it. And uh, we gave him some powders and some antibiotics that we had to uh, put on them, but we, nobody thought it was going to do any good, and they were much better. But the next day he showed up with a friend who was really bad, and uh, whatever it was that they had, he had it all over him. And, uh, and, uh, he couldn't speak English, of course, and there's none of us could speak any Chinese, so we didn't really accomplish anything to help him. But that's the kind of contact we had. Mm -hmm. We didn't have any uh, government contact that is the, as far as the service is concerned. What were the men like within your group? Uh, well, they most were. of you must have been had technical knowledge, knowledge because you were working on experimental helicopters and so on. Well, there, there, were, there was an engineering officer, of course. Mm -hmm. you know, from Chicago and all, and uh, the uh, captain, there was a captain in charge of the squadron, and he was in charge of all our activities, and uh, he was from Carolina, and uh, we had an adjutant who was from uh, Georgia, so it was a mixture of people, mm -hmm. and we had half a dozen pilots, some, several, just helicopter pilots, and several pilots who flew the other airplanes. The C-47 when we had DC-3. Mm -hmm. Were you ever attacked by the Japanese? Oh no, no there were no Japanese around that. We were in the neighborhood of Kunming, okay. which is uh, in the interior of China. There were no Japanese in there at that time. How successful do you think your work was with the helicopters? Well, I think it gave some exercise to that idea. And of course, helicopters turned out to be a very important part of the Army mm -hmm. operation, much more than we would have anticipated at that point. But I think we saw things we could do and what we couldn't do, what we needed to do to help. But the big change came when they, they just made better helicopters than what are used today. Now, how, you know, with these being experimental, just how many did they have? Uh, a number of passengers they could carry, or how, how large were these helicopters? Well, they were normally a two-person helicopter, mm -hmm. and, uh, but you could they could take the load of so putting a slinger on or something, oh. carrying another person. That was mm -hmm. the, uh, but there's two pilot two the two pilot places two places you could fly from, them, and uh, a big hull, of course, in front of him, you know, so you had a good view. Of Now, were any of these armed, or were they just no? They were more for rescue. They were strictly I was just for rescue. They were yeah, no, they weren't. We didn't. Mm -hmm. We didn't have any arms. Either. Did you carry a personal sidearm? Yes, everyone had a personal sidearm uh, issued to them. And, uh, I had a small submachine gun that was issued to us. Never fired a shot that night. Now, what were your officers like? Well, they were very comfortable people. They were uh, interested in this idea of working in a separate unit like this on a separate project. Mm -hmm. And they were very capable people. Now, was this a volunteer unit, or were you all assigned to it? I was assigned to it. I, mean, I don't know any reason that people would be volunteers mm -hmm. to it. Yeah, there was yeah. no special reason to volunteer to it. I think it was a, when uh, I was just called out of the class I was teaching at uh, Chinook Field there. And, uh, 
called into the front office there and I thought I'd done something pretty bad. But uh, they told me I'd been assigned to a squadron. And, uh, we didn't find out what the squadron was going to do for quite a while. So we went over to India by via uh, uh, transport, you know. And, uh, now were all the helicopters on the ship with you? Oh no, no, the helicopters came. As a matter of fact, when we landed in India, there were there was the aircraft were still to arrive. Uh, and we weren't there yet. Now, did you, where did you pick your aircraft up, in China or in India? No, we picked up, well, the helicopters, I think, were picked up in China. Mm -hmm. I, did, I didn't think they were delivered to China. Yeah, I was wondering how they would fly over the mountains. Uh, I, I don't know. They, uh, I don't know how the helicopters got into that. Mm -hmm. I flew in, in in our own plane that we were taking in a, a C-47. We just uh, flew from Calcutta into China. Okay. Did you ever uh, catch any uh, tropical or any diseases from being there or have any illnesses? No. I had, I had some I had some skin thing that I picked up somewhere along the way. It was just a little spot of skin. The, the, uh, doctor had some material, to some sap to put on it, but he said, you probably won't really get rid of that until you get back in the U.S. and uh, get something that we can take care of, and that's what happened. I had that little spot on me for months. Mm -hmm. I would continue to put his cream on, which kept it from spreading, I guess, mm -hmm. but, uh, but uh, fortunately nobody got really sick. And, uh, Were there any casualties in your unit from Accidents or anything? Or? No. No, I don't think so. We never had a, any problem. With so the work of the helicopters must have been fairly successful then. Well, we never rescued anyone. Mm -hmm. and so we, uh, the, uh, so okay, if you were to measure the success in that. Well, we just by it. I think flying the helicopters must have. Well, they did. They we did fly them, and we did yeah. see the problems that there were. Some of the, mm -hmm. Some people came in from Sikorsky to talk with us about how it was going, and then they left. So they were being checked up. So basically, you guys laid the groundwork for uh, Helleborn Hel operations in Korea and, and then oh, yeah, laid, that, later Vietnam. Yeah, the, uh, it, was so, it was such a different animal than uh, mm -hmm. later on. So what we had was not the common helicopter you think of today doing a regular military task. Mm -hmm. It was a unique vehicle. Mm -hmm. okay. um, how long were you in China? Not long. Uh, I would say in the order of three months or something like that. Four months. I, I, I really don't know. But it was towards the end of the war. Mm -hmm. The war ended while I was in China. Oh, okay. Um, how were you informed about the end of the war? Well, we had radio, of course, right. okay. and we, we kept up on the news and mm -hmm. listened to the radio programs. What was the reaction? Uh, you must have been there when President Roosevelt died? No, I wasn't. As a matter of fact, I was on board ship. When oh, okay. Roosevelt. What was the reaction when you heard that? Well, that was a very sad thing. I think nobody wanted to see that happen. Mm -hmm. I remember the reaction being mm -hmm. uniform and even after that. How about the dropping of the atomic bombs? Were you well, I, aware of that? Or? Yes, indeed. I can remember that mm -hmm. as being a, a very significant thing. Uh, I had taken a course at Minnesota where they talked about that, uh, what an, how an atomic bomb worked, you know, they, mm -hmm. they, how atomic or nuclear reactions happen. And, uh, so I had the idea, I knew how the, the bomb worked, which was a big point of discussion. Say, what, what is an atomic bomb? Mm -hmm. and, uh, so I remember that very carefully. What was the reaction at your camp on when the war was announced that it, it was ended? Uh, the reaction was when we go home. <laughs> <laughs> 
When did you finally go home? I got home in uh, late November, I think it was, of 45, towards the end of November 45. Mm -hmm. I got home in time for Christmas, actually. Okay. When were you discharged? Uh, the following uh, March, I think it was. I had some leave time coming, of course, which comes in. What did you do between November 45 and, and the, your discharge? I worked in a gas station most of the time the, the, because I was I, uh, had leave time coming. Oh, okay. And, uh, but uh, we went to Fort Dix and we had to get checked out of the Army. Mm -hmm. Now, did you uh, ever make use of the GI Bill? Oh, yes. It was a, that was the greatest thing that happened to me in the war. But, as I say, I worked at a gas station until my school started. And I went back to the University of Minnesota. Got my bachelor's degree there and, uh, in physics. And uh, that was a feeling of being home again after having been there originally in, in the Army. And uh, then I left the University of Buffalo in the graduate school in physics. And uh, used the GI Bill through it, of course. Do you think you're, were you always interested in, in science or do you think maybe being exposed to it when you went to University of Minnesota or well, that, experiences? I, that experience was a very big turning point to me mm -hmm. because the fact that uh, this going to school was such a treat that, uh, and the fact that I could do well in science courses mm -hmm. was all a big surprise to me. So that was a very positive thing for me. Did you ever use the 5220 clock at all? No, no, no. It was like an unemployment insurance, uh, $20 a week for 52 weeks. I mean, if you started right back to work, you, you may not have used it at all. No, I never did. I, I wouldn't have known what that was. No. <laughs> okay. no, when I got out, as I say, I have some leave coming in, but I also had to wait until the next semester was starting at the uh, University of Minnesota. Mm -hmm. And so for several months, as I was saying, I was in a gas station. That was just a filling. Mm -hmm. Did you ever uh, stay in contact with anyone that was in service with you? No, not in the, not in the long run. But we had some contact, of course. Mm -hmm. How about joining any veterans organizations? Did you I did them? join the, the Veterans of Foreign Wars, mm -hmm. BFW for a couple of years, but uh, it was just uh, somebody suggested I might want to join it. had some social applications with it. In a way, you, you answered this, but how would you say your time in the service changed or had an effect on your life? Oh, I think a spectacular effect on my life would have made me go back to school and get uh, degrees in physics so I could work in that field. Mm -hmm. it was, uh, Critical change. Up to that time, I was working in an insurance company. I think I would have probably just stayed there. Mm -hmm. Okay, could you hold this up and, and tell us where and when that was taken? Well, actually, this is when we, uh, our officer training school, got moved to San Antonio, and uh, this is a picture, picture of me standing in front of the album. And, uh, Did you ever get to see any USO shows at all? No, not at home. I saw one in <coughs> India, which I can't tell you who was in it. I couldn't at the time, as a matter of fact, but I did see a, a USO show. Mm -hmm. there. Okay, well, thank you very much for your I time. wasn't flying a helicopter. Yeah. Did you ever get to go up in one at that oh, yeah. point? Yeah, sure. I've gone many times. So you probably got a little bit of stick time. Well, they let me try taking it off, but it was a uh -huh. very complicated thing to do. It was very important to turn the, the handle at the same time as you were pulling it, and you had to have that synchronized to be able to fly it correctly. Mm -hmm. So they told me. Mm -hmm. uh, now you probably also had the collective too, that you to make it go up and down. There was a handle on the left. There was a handle the on the left. Yes. yes. There, there was. It was a very complicated thing to fly. 
Mm -hmm. Of course, covered in blood. But uh, they, uh, let's say, they let me take it off while I, they watch carefully. <laughs> okay, that's enough. <laughs> the, uh, but I wrote in it many times. Now, did those helicopters have wooden blades back then? Do you do you remember? As I told you, remember. Okay. The blades were made of. Well, you had the bubble up front. You said. Yes. Was that glass or a plexiglass? No, a plexiglass. Or plexiglass. Or okay. Made that same strange noise of whack, 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 whack. Mm -hmm. um, that you couldn't carry a lot inside of it. You said there, there wasn't much no, room there to carry wasn't much room inside of it. Now, if you had to, I should ask this, you, we had to do a rescue, you could only do one person at a time? Oh, yes, right. Uh -huh. So basically, they would, uh, like if there were a lot of trees around, just lower a line and the, the down pilot would grab onto it. Well, and they, they, You said they never rescued it. They, they never actually. But, but I mean, the, the concept of it was to pull them out of the oh, jungle the, until the, they could. The concept we were working on was to be able to land there. Mm -hmm. Attached them in a, in a sling, you know, in a, uh, what would you call it, a, a cot type thing that would oh, okay. be held onto the bottom mm -hmm. of the helicopter. Oh, okay, it would be underneath it then. You, yeah. have, you didn't have room on the side for it. Well, there wasn't room inside. Uh, I mean, yeah. on the sides of it to carry a, a stretcher on the side, it had to be under, slung underneath you, well, the helicopter. Yeah, it wouldn't be alongside oh, okay. underneath. Mm -hmm. But we never actually rescued it. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. Well,